Dear students, today we're going to look at corporate governance. It's a really important topic that is covered in chapter four. It has to do with how the board of directors do their fiduciary responsibility for not only the shareholders, but also the communities that businesses are engaged in. That means that they have to focus on what the management team is actually doing and holding them accountable. Because if the management team is doing a great job, it's a win-win situation for everyone. But if they go wild, ooh, that is bad for everyone. So I hope you will enjoy. See you soon. This chapter will cover environmental, social, and corporate governance, which refers to the three central factors in measuring the sustainability and the impact on society of an investment in a company or in a business. The idea is to have a criteria that better helps determine the future financial performance of companies. Corporate social governance is the self-regulation that is a part of a firm's business model. The goal is to be both compliant with the law of the land, ensure ethical standards, and follow international norms. Environmental Social Corporate Governance, or ESG, is a catch-all term for the criteria used in socially responsible investing. It goes beyond the scarce resources traditionally including as labor, land, and capital, and also entrepreneurship. ESG looks at the sustainability of these diminishing resources and pay attention to future needs of future generations. Socially responsible investing is a process of screening your investments on both positive and negative business practices. It also includes shareholder activism, which promotes proxy voting and shareholder resolutions. Another factor of social responsible investing is that the investment firm should engage in different kinds of community improving activities. That means sometimes they will donate time or money. Anytime you have a environmental disaster, you should compare it with previous disasters of similar types. In this example, we will compare the 2010 BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico with the Ixtox-1 oil spill of 1979. Although 35,000 oil wells have been drilled in the Gulf of Mexico, two have gone wrong, and when they did, it caused an environmental disaster. The BP oil spill of 2010 estimated roughly 320,000 barrels of oil that was leaked out. So what would the fine be and what would the estimated cost to clean up result in? The Clean Water Act has a fine of $1,100 per barrel. And the EPA has a fine of $4,300 per barrel. So the reasonable fine would be about $1.7 billion for BP. However, the government estimated a, an, an expense, blah, blah, blah. We're going to delete this part. However, the government, blah, 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 delete that. However, the government estimated that the total cost of the disaster was about $20 billion. And that includes the loss of tourism, business, cleanup, and all the other factors built into it not just the cost of the fines. When you have a crisis on your hands, you need to get the information fast, you need to get it right, and then you have to communicate and get it out. And as soon as you can, you wanna get it over so that you can move on and do good. The cost of the BP oil spill resulted in a loss of shareholder value of over a hundred billion dollars. That's the loss of mac, uh, market cap in just a few short trading days. And the, the reason this all happened was that they must have used a flimsy little piece of equipment that um, uh, 
doesn't cost more than uh, five hundred thousand uh, dollars. And the question is, if they would have used better equipment, would this have been avoidable? Now, those are the types of decisions you need to make when you're in that management position to look at: is it worth the risk to use a piece of equipment that every so often will fail, or do you want to have something that's almost guaranteed not to fail? But the result was that they made a bad decision and it cost the shareholders a hundred billion dollars besides the some twenty billion dollars worth of economic loss for the society around the Gulf. Today in Alaska, crude oil production was all but stopped on, an, on the North Slope. Oil companies operating there were told to cut their production by more than 80 percent after thousands of barrels of crude oil spilled from the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline. The 800-mile Trans-Alaska oil pipeline, at least for right now, is shut down. That spill in Alaska is happening, of course, in the shadow of a much larger spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, actually, you know what, if it's okay with you guys... In the control room, I, I think we should just probably just have me stop doing this now and let the Gravitas white guy anchor do this part. Let's do that. In Alaska, the pipeline has been repaired. Oil is expected to flow again today. But that crack that developed Sunday allowed 1,500 barrels of crude oil to escape. 700 barrels recovered. And in the Gulf of Mexico, oil workers are trying to handle a much larger oil spill. A burning offshore oil well is dumping 30,000 barrels of crude each day into the Gulf. So, yeah, that was from 1979, June 13th, 1979. That NBC News anchor reporting on a pipeline spill in Alaska on the same day that an oil well was leaking out of control and burning in the Gulf of Mexico. 31 years ago, in June 1979, an oil well called the Ixtoc blew out in the Gulf of Mexico. It started spewing thousands of barrels of crude oil into the Gulf every day. And it's not just the disaster itself that should sound familiar to you, it's also the techniques that they were using at the time to try to contain the spill. Airplanes are to be used to drop chemicals on the oil, but there is a shortage of aviation fuel down there. And the workers are also putting up a mile-long boom. They're putting it into place. They're trying to contain the oil slick in the Gulf of Mexico. Chemical dispersants being spread across the Gulf by plane. Mile-long booms being set up to contain the oil slick on the surface. If you close your eyes and you just listen to these news reports from 1979, you would be forgiven from thinking, for thinking that you had flipped on the news today. The Ixtoc rig erupted in the middle of the night in 1979 in June as it was drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. The drilling was being done by a company called Sedco. Sedco later became known as TransOcean. The operator of the rig that blew up this year in the Gulf of Mexico. The reason the Ixtoc explosion turned into a massive uncontrolled leak 30 years ago is because the well's blowout preventer malfunctioned. Sound familiar? The blowout preventer failed to stop the Ixtoc leak, and what followed was an environmental disaster the likes of which the country had never seen before. Floating barriers are still being stretched across the waterway near South Padre Island to keep approaching oil from spoiling this popular sport fishing area, which is also vital to shrimp fishing and endangered wildlife. Oil skimming vessels are also being put into service to catch any patches of oil which may get through. About five miles offshore, another team of private oil containment workers is prepared to intercept drifting oil before it gets to land. The Coast Guard has already said it will be impossible to get it all, and they're particularly concerned about oil moving underwater. Plumes of oil moving underwater, oil containment teams, skimming vessels. Again, these are not badly colorized reports from the BP oil disaster in the Gulf right now. This is reporting from Deja Vu Land, from essentially the same disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, but in 1979. The only thing missing back then was worries that the loop current would carry the oil out of the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the coast of Florida. Oh, wait. There is now a distinct possibility that oil spilling from that runaway Mexican well could spread as far as the Gulf Coast of Florida. That from an official of the EPA. The Extoc disaster in 1979 in the Gulf of Mexico went on for weeks. Then weeks turned into months. The reason it went on for so long is because even though oil companies were allowed to drill offshore like that, it turns out they didn't know how to stop a leak when disaster struck. Nothing they tried worked. 
In the Gulf of Mexico, rain and heavy seas are hampering efforts to cap a Mexican oil well it has been spilling since June 3rd, the worst spill in history. Workers are trying to put a giant cone over the well. Despite inclement weather, they may try again today. Trying to put a giant cone over the well. In 2010, this giant cone strategy is what we were sort of euphemistically calling the top hat. I wonder if they had a euphemistic name for it back in 1979. Mexican officials are calling it Operation Sombrero. Workers have been trying since the weekend to put a 300-ton steel cone over the mouth of the runaway well. Officials say once in place, the cone will collect up to 90% of the crude oil, which has been gushing from the well for more than three and a half months. From 10,000 to 30,000 barrels a day have flowed into the Bay of Campeche and the Gulf of Mexico. As with BP's top hat, the Ixtoc spills... Operation Sombrero ultimately failed to stop the leak, but they had other ideas back then that were sure to solve the problem. Ideas like shooting metal spheres into the well to cut the flow of oil. You might call that today a junk shot. They also tried pumping cement and salt water into the leaking well to try to jam it up. You might call that a top kill maneuver. Neither of those things worked. For months and months and months and months and months, the Ixtoc well continued to leak uncontrollably. Until? Until? Two relief wells are still being drilled to relieve pressure on the blown out well, so it eventually can be capped. Relief wells. Nine agonizingly long months after the Ixtoc well exploded, a pair of relief wells finally allowed the engineers to cap the leaking well. That was 31 years ago. I am 37 years old, and this happened when I was six. Those haircuts are back in fashion. And the stuff that did not work back then is the same stuff that hasn't worked now. Same busted blowout preventer, same ineffective boom, same underwater plumes, same toxic dispersant, same failed containment domes, same junk shot, same top kill. It's all the same technology. The Ixtoc well, which couldn't be plugged for nine months, was in roughly 200 feet of water. Now in 2010, we're using the same exact techniques to try to plug a well that is leaking in 5,000 feet of water. Now look, maybe this top kill maneuver will work. We obviously hope and pray that it does. Praying does seem wiser than hoping at this point. That said, as we reported earlier this hour, BP executive Doug Suttle says tonight that it looks like it's drilling mud and not oil. That is what's now coming out of the ruptured well, but they can't tell for sure. The thing that's essentially been guaranteed to work in the past is a relief well, and that's still months away from being complete. The oil companies keep talking about how technologically advanced they are, but what they've gotten technologically advanced at is drilling deeper. They haven't gotten any more advanced on how to deal with the risks attached to that. They haven't made any technological advances in the last 30 years when it comes to stopping a leak like this when it happens. All they've gotten better at is making the risks worse by putting these leaks further out of our reach. Oh, hey, congratulations. Now the thing you can't stop is a full mile underwater. That's all they've gotten better at. That and making themselves the most profitable industry the universe has ever seen, and I am not exaggerating. Officials say the oil could reach all the way to Florida as it continues to threaten the U.S. coast for months. William Monroe, NBC News, South Padre Island, Texas. Conflict of interest happened almost at the same time as the initial idea of the corporation was founded and drafted into law. It's one of those innovations that... Um, has really helped build nations. The idea that shareholders can pool money to start a business and the business would then be protected by a limited amount of liability and it has done a lot of good but at the same time it has resulted in conflict and in interest. So what can we do about this? Some of the remedies for the agency problems is to create laws and come up with ideas how to do corporate governance, draft policies, and so on. But at some point, there needs to be a consequence of law when someone majorly misbehaves. Just because something is legal doesn't make it ethical. So corporate governance is really looking at how to, can we 
put in an extra layer of safety that protects not only the shareholders, but also the stakeholders. As a result, a lot of shareholders have filed shareholder resolutions that have been picked up and voted on through proxies, forcing corporations to impose and draft corporate governance reporting. The idea is to have an efficient way of managing risk and have this mechanism them allow corporations to not only raise a bunch of money but also be held accountable for that money and their shareholders and stakeholders the key weakness will always be between managers and the shareholders it's very unfortunate that we get conflict of interest laws put in place after major crisis such as the Great Re uh, Depression and now the Great Recession that we had in 20, 2008 to say 12. In principle, shareholders are the ones that elect the board of directors and their job is to make sure that the shareholder value is held intact. They also have to take a look at uh, how things work for stakeholders. So. The board of directors are hired by the shareholders and their job is to hire and fire the managers of the company, such as a CEO, CFO, COO, and so on. Unfortunately, many boards are very management friendly. And this management side is often dominated by a board of directors that are relatively few outsiders come in and get to do a real fiduciary responsibility. The whole idea of a independent board of directors is to monitor the management team, to actually do some serious reviews and hold the executives responsible. The structure and the legal charge of corporation and board of directors at vary a great deal across nation states. In England, most public boards are following by volunteering to follow the code of best practice on how to engage in corporate governance. But it doesn't mean that they have to follow it. The British way of doing things is that it's prudent to have at least three outside directors and that the board chairman and the CEO should be different individuals. In Germany, the board of directors has an emphasis of actually not only taking care of uh, the shareholders, but a very strong anchored interest in taking care of the stakeholders. And that includes the people that are working for the business, uh, the unions, the uh, creditors, uh, the vendors, and everyone else in the organization and outside the organization executives and their incentives it's very difficult to design a compensation package that gives executives both the incentive to work hard and increase shareholder value indirectly we're asking executives to risk the shareholder value on a daily basis yet take a fiduciary responsibility for these shareholders at the same time we're asking them to take on as much risk as they can, but not so much that they go bankrupt. Some of the problems is that the incentives are so tied in that there's a conflict of interest where accounting-based schemes are subject to bad accounting practices. That's how Arthur Anderson got involved with Enron, and that whole thing just blew up. One very popular way of giving incentives to executives is through stock options. The idea is that they increase shareholder value and that results in the value of the options to increase. It's very nice to have a simple tool of using derivatives to align the executive's 
decisions with that of the shareholders. The stock options, which are indirectly call options and would technically be called warrants because it has a long term to maturity, is intended to make sure that the management team works and stays in the business for a long time and conduct business in a way that it grows and makes lots of money. The problem is if the business has a hard time making sufficient amount of sales, which is really what drives a business, then the executive can still exercise his or her options by cutting costs, by getting rid of um, expensive manufacturing and, and sending that overseas to a low cost country like China, Vietnam, the Philippines. It then results in lots of layoffs that puts extra burden on society as a whole. Another thing is that they might say, we're going to use our profits, and instead of paying that out as dividends, we're going to use that to buy back stock that increases the value of the stock, and it enables their stock options to be in the money. We might say, shouldn't some of this money that has been earned be put away into a rainy day fund? But very often, the executives would just say, nah, Let's just buy back stock because that makes my options increase in value. But if they decided to pay it out as dividend, it wouldn't help their stock price and it wouldn't help their options. The capital markets do their part because if Wall Street sees that management team is really out of control, the share price will decline. At some point, a corporate raider will buy up enough shares to actually gain control of the board of directors. Some of these corporate raiders might be hedge funds or activist investors, uh, like investors such as uh, maybe Warren Buffett or Carl Icahn. They will see great value in an organization, that, but they might say the management team needs to restructure the organization and make it more profitable, more streamlined, and more focused on adding value to their customers, their shareholders, their communities. If investors believe that a corporation is actually doing the right thing right, they have an excellent management team, they're creating great value to their customers, their clients, their stakeholders, that would result in investors being willing to pay more for that stock, for that investment. And that's why it's important to have strong laws that protects investors. Now remember, a lot of these investors are representatives of pension funds, the hard earning working individuals that work and do the day to day jobs in America. So, it's bad to say that we're going to feel that investors are evil because even the little union guy that pays his dues is a shareholder. So the existence of well-developed financial markets promoted by strong investor protection may stimulate economic growth by making funds readily available for investments at the low cost. Financial development can contribute to economic growth in three different types of ways. One, it enhances savings. It channels savings towards real investments in productive uh, companies. And it enhances the efficiency of investments allocation. Some of the market participants are a part of the watchdogs over the corporations, but they behave differently. So it's important to understand how they're motivated by money because that drives their decisions. So a buy side individual or organization is paid to put the money of risks of others. 
to maximize his fees by increasing the value of the portfolio. A sell side uh, organization will be paid to drive transaction volume. It wants to maximize its fees. Principal investors investing their own funds and want to maximize return. Issuers of capital makes money by raising capital for others. Their compensation is tied to the size and the share price of the companies. Market makers watch and match up buyers and sellers while charging a bid ask spread. They make more money when there's a lot of volatility in the market. The media, on the other hand, they get paid by selling eyeballs. They get paid by having as much people watching their show or reading their articles through advertisement. And this creates hypes and breaking news. So the more they can come up with hypes and breaking news, and some people call it fake news, more people will watch it. And as a result, they make more money in marketing revenue. Foreign exchange brokers will buy and sell currency for a fee, but they seldom take any positions themselves. International banks look for arbitrage opportunities and buy and sell currency for their clients. Central banks, well, they try to influence currencies against other major currencies. They can do that through communication, open market activities such as buying and selling bonds or selling and buying currencies, increasing and decreasing interest rates, or changing the reserve requirements.